Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. As he said, uh, spent quite a few summers uh, at this place when it was called Southampton College and, and did considerable research here. This pi picture here is taken from Akabonic Harbor in Springs, where we have a house. So I'm um, sort of local part of the time, anyway. And uh, the picture here is the cover picture of the book that I wrote a few years ago. And the book was called Salt Marshes, A Natural and Unnatural History. And that's the, the gist of the talk that I'm about to inflict on you here. And um, I also brought a bunch of books along in case anybody should want to buy one after um, the, the talk here. OK, starting off, what is a salt marsh, after all? It's a wetland, number one, meaning that the roots of the plant are in soil that is wet all the time. Uh, and it's also, what makes it a salt marsh is that it's in salt water, at least partial salt water. It's a, a wetland that is next adjacent to an estuary. And an estuary is a place where fresh water and salt water meet. And we have Shinnecock Bay right here, uh, this is an estuary. Uh, one thing that's notable in a, salt, in, an, in a salt marsh is that there is zonation of the plants. And we'll look at that in a second in a little more detail. Um, the low part of the marsh is covered with water a lot more time than the high marsh because we've got tides that go up and down twice in the course of every day. So the low marsh is underwater perhaps about half the time, or in some cases, even more than half the time. And the low marsh is dominated by a plant called cordgrass, scientific name Spartina alterniflora. And here's a little bit more diagrammatic look at zonation. This is a sort of a profile of a marsh. You have some plants, this would be the Spartina or cordgrass down here, in the low marsh, where they are covered with water a lot of the time. And then you go higher up, and you're in a kind of middle marsh area and a high marsh. And you're getting other kinds of plants that are salt tolerant, because they do get some salt water. But they are mostly in the air, whereas the Spartina, the roots here are wet in salt water full time. So you have a, a, a gradation here along the edge of the marsh uh, which is called zonation, different species at different levels. If we look at the plants in a salt marsh, they've got to deal with some things that most plants don't know how to deal with. They have to deal with salt water. If you were to water your plants at home with salt water, they would be very unhappy. Um, and so to deal with the salt water, the uh, Spartina, which is the one that's lowest down, I don't know if you can see, there's little white dots on the leaves here. They have special glands that excrete the salt. So they bring in salt water through their roots, and they can excrete it with their leaves. A second issue that plants low in a salt marsh have to deal with is that the soil that their roots are in has very low oxygen because it's wet all the time. It is very low oxygen. And uh, we said it's got salt glands to excrete the salt. It also has special tissues that pump air down. The upper part of the plant is in the air. And, and the air that it incorporates in the upper part of the plant can get pumped downward into the roots so that the roots uh, ha have some oxygen. Here's a look at some other plants in the salt marsh. This is salt hay, probably quite familiar to a lot of you. It, it is be, it's also a Spartina. It's Spartina patens. It's behind the cord grass, uh, a little higher in the marsh. This is called salt wart. It's a succulent plant. And it's also kind of fun to pick it and put it in a salad. Um, seaside lavender, these are some of the ones that are higher up. These are kind of bushy plants. The marsh elder and the groundsel are kind of shrubby, bushy plants up in the high marsh. These are never really underwater, perhaps in some, you know, Hurricane Sandy or something, they're underwater, but not under normal circumstances. 
All right. What what does a salt marsh do? What what you know what functions does it have? Well, it's a breeding ground for a whole lot of marine animals, a bunch of different fishes, crabs, birds, and so forth. So it's a it's a nursery ground and breeding ground. It's also a stopping off place for migratory birds. There's a lot of food there for migratory birds. It's a habitat for some mammals as well. And salt marshes overall have very high productivity. When you think of what's a kind of environment that's very, very productive, you're likely to think of a coral reef or a tropical rainforest. Salt marshes are not as glamorous as coral reefs and tropical rainforests, but they're extremely productive also. And another thing that salt marshes do is flood control. Having all this vegetation uh, can prevent some water movement, and, and areas uh, with more marshes or mangroves are generally not as harmed by tidal surges, hurricanes, and so forth than areas that don't have marshes. And it also functions in filtration. If there's polluted water running off, the marsh can trap pollution as well. Okay, looking at the productivity, I said a minute ago that marshes are extremely productive. As I said, it, it's very high. However, when you think of a highly productive area, there's lots of things that are eating the plants. Now, in the case of a salt marsh, there are relatively few things that eat the plants when they're still alive. This is in, in contrast with, let's say, um, the open plains where you have, uh, you know, buffalo or antelopes or, you know, deer or whatever browsing on the grasses. In a salt marsh, there's not very many animals that do that. Most of the productivity of the marsh grasses goes into the food web after the grasses, the plants, die. So in the fall, the plants die, the leaves fall off, the whole thing falls over onto the marsh surface and decays. And it turns into stuff we call detritus. And it's in this form that it is eaten by a whole lot of animal, aquatic marine animals. It becomes what we call detritus. Detritus or litter looks kind of like that. Doesn't look too appetizing to us, but there's a lot of animals that think it's great. It also is not just the decaying plant material, but there are, are single-celled algae that are very abundant in here that a lot of the animals that we call detritus feeders are actually getting most of their nutrition from the algae that are associated with the detritus. OK, so who are these detritus feeders? There are worms, there are clams, there are crabs. There are a lot of, kind of, a lot of small animals that are the food for bigger animals, bigger fish. Uh, birds, mammals, and so forth. So it, it becomes part of the food chain. Some look at some important marsh animals. This is the rib mussel. Uh, it anchors itself down in the marsh. It puts out these um, threads that anchor it down. It attached to little pebbles and so forth. And the rib mussels actually enhance the growth of the uh, marsh grasses their wastes become fertilizer for the plants that are growing. They also, these threads help bind the sediments together so there will be less erosion of the marsh soil. Here's another, this is one of my favorite animals, fiddler crabs um, that live in marshes. They dig burrows in the marsh edge and um, that those burrows help get some oxygen down into deeper layers uh, under the, the sand or mud. And then there's a bunch of other little smaller invertebrates, including the, the amphipod. The top left is an amphipod. The top right is something called an isopod. There are many different kinds of these. And then there are worms that live in the mud. 
And all of these help to break down the detritus into smaller pieces and eat the detritus and the algae associated with them. So we've got this whole community that's really based on the plant detritus. Here's a few more um, invertebrates uh, living in marshes. We've got uh, some different kinds of snails mud snail here. Melampus is one that likes to climb up on stems of plants. This one is out in the air a lot of the time. Here's another one that's out in the air sometime, the marsh periwinkles. These are boat shells. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of different kinds of uh, mollusks uh, on the marshes. Here's some crustaceans. We've got shrimp. These are grass shrimp here, and this is a sand shrimp here and there are barnacles. Whenever you have a, a something solid surface, you'll find barnacles settling on, on pebbles. If you've got a dock or some, something solid, uh, barnacles will settle. And then a bunch of crabs we can find on the marsh. We've got um, hermit crabs here. This is another, the, the long-legged and the flat claw hermit crab. We've got blue crabs, we've got the green crab, got various kind of mud crabs. We have this is not really a crab at all. We call it a horseshoe crab. It's not really a crab. It's much more closely related to spiders than it is to real crabs. But it's, it's common there. You've probably encountered it uh, along the shore. And then we have a bunch of different fishes that are uh, found in salt marshes. These are here killifish or mummy chugs. Uh, silver sides, uh, sheep's head minnow, sticklebacks, flounders, pipefish, so a bunch of little fishes. These are living in the tidal creeks, in the salt marshes, and these are food for the larger fishes that you and I might want to eat, like striped bass or something. And then we've got turtles in the salt marshes. This diamondback terrapin is a salt marsh resident and a bunch of birds, got herring gulls, ospreys, bitterns that are associated with salt marshes, and they are feeding on the fish and the crabs. Here's one having a crab um, of the marshes. And a few more birds, skimmers, rails, oyster catchers. I could go on for a long time with birds, I'll go a few more for those of you that are fans of birds, you know, egrets, cormorants, herons, terns, and so forth. By the way, many of these pictures are, are local from East End salt marshes. And then there are some things we find in the marshes that we don't love too much. Um, this is really the top of the food chain, isn't it? They're uh, eating us. So they're the top of the food chain. Uh, they're not much fun. Now, so this is sort of a brief overview of what is a salt marsh and who lives there. So that's what I refer to as the natural history. And the, the second part of the book is called the unnatural history. So this is dealing with how people have altered uh, or messed up or otherwise had deleterious effects on salt marshes. And I divide it up into physical effects, chemical effects, biological changes. So this is a look first at physical changes. One of the most obvious ones is digging ditches. If you see a marsh, this is an aerial view with all these straight lines. That is not natural. A tidal creek, a natural creek looks like this. If you've got a bunch of straight line creeks like this, people dug them. That's not a natural thing. Uh, this was done earlier in the 20th century. It was thought that this would be a way to drain the marshes and perhaps reduce mosquitoes. If you got more water off the marshes, there would be less breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So they did this ditching, and it didn't work very well for mosquitoes, uh, but it altered the ecology of marshes and uh, reduced populations of uh, birds and fish that needed the pools on the marsh surface. And this, by the way, is from Akabonic, 
harbor so i would say about thirty forty years ago people realizing that the ditching didn't seem to do much good about the mosquitoes devised a, a new type of uh, approach to mosquitoes they call open marsh water management we call it OMWAM for short and uh, the idea here is, is actually totally opposite the idea of the ditches the idea here is to keep those pools on the marsh surface so you can put sandbags or plank of wood or something so that the marsh when the tide is going out doesn't drain so well and what you will have is then more pools. And who lives in the pools? Killifish. And the killifish love to eat mosquito larvae. So um, by using a totally oper opposite approach, this seems, I mean, it doesn't get rid of all mosquitoes either. You're going to have mosquitoes if you've got a marsh. But this seems to be perhaps even more effective than the, uh, the ditching approach. Some other types of human physical changes in marshes was harvesting the salt hay. That's the, the Spartina patent. Uh, and this was um, done throughout New England, and, I th and it was done on Long Island, too. Uh, so this was removing it every fall and harvesting it. Other things that people have done is fill marshes. Here's a before and after picture. Here's some marsh where you see the water, and then here is the no water left anymore. Um, this is ex extensively done in the Northeast. Most of our cities, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, have grown considerably at the expense of marshes. They fill in the salt marshes. We built LaGuardia Airport and Kennedy Airport and Newark Airport on salt marshes ditto in, in Boston. So, um, and, and it's not just for airports, it's for expanding house, you know, housing, ex just expanding cities. At that time, marshes were considered pretty useless, and it was, a, you know, they were having the mosquitoes and the flies. Who needs this? Let's fill it in. We can develop it, build houses, have stores, businesses, airports, and so forth. Um, the land use, even if it's not directly filling a marsh, the land use, if you have a lot of development near a marsh, uh, it can have effect because if you have a lot of development, you have a lot more paved surfaces, what's called impervious surfaces, which means that when it rains, the water can't just sink into the ground, it runs off. If you've got sidewalks and store uh, and roads all over the place, there is much less area for the rain to sink in the ground, and it runs off and goes into the marsh, carrying more pollution with it. And here's something else pretty common around here, building bulkheads at the edge of what used to be a marsh, and now instead of that gradual slope with the different plants on it, we now extend your lawn out to the edge and build a vertical wall. So now the marsh is really gone. It not only um, removes the whole marsh, but it changes the water flow patterns in the, in the water because the water is kind of now in a channel. It, can't, it hasn't got the, smooth, the, the gentle slope. It's channel. It's going to be um, moving faster. There's some current salt marsh problems happening in a number of different areas, which is uh, called subsidence, which is sinking. The marshes are sinking down. This is happening, you know, at a huge extent in Louisiana, where, you know, they're losing huge number, amount of marshes. I don't think I have a number here. But, you know, it's something like a football field every hour or every minute or something of marsh being lost in Louisiana because it's sinking. Um, and the reason why this is happening, one reason, is that by channeling, that is putting the Mississippi, building levees on the side of, of the Mississippi River, preventing it from flooding, that sends all the water out into the Gulf of Mexico, 
and doesn't allow water with sediments to come onto the marshes. Marshes have to have new sediments to rise up. And you're depriving the marsh of new sediments, so it's sinking down. And another thing that's happening at the same time, of course, is sea level rise. So the marshes are sinking and the sea level is rising. That doubles your problem. And of course, when this happens, you have less marsh and more open water. So this picture is representing what used to be a whole continuous marsh, and now it's getting chopped, you know, divided into little patches of marsh, and eventually that whole thing will be gone. Uh, just a look at sea level rise. This is, you know, the record up till, I don't know, 2010 maybe. Uh, and you can see going up, um, you know, pretty steadily, the sea level rise. Uh, it's happening because the climate is getting warmer, and it's happening because ice uh, and glaciers and so forth are melting. So um, it, it's happening, and it's happening at an accelerating rate. It's not happening at an exactly the same rate everywhere. It's happening faster. In some areas, New York, New Jersey area is happening faster than some other areas. So faced with sea level rise, what's an intertidal marsh going to be able to do? It's either got to rise up, you've got to provide it with more sediments so it can elevate and keep up with the sea level rise, or it's got to be able to move inland. And of course, if you have roads and houses directly inland of the marsh, as they do in much of New Jersey, uh, there's nowhere to go. You know, you can't move inland when you've got, you know, Route 1 right there and houses and so forth. So there's the issue. Will they run into people development and parking lots and routes and Main Street? Interesting that the invasive plant, the common reed phragmites that most people hate, um, and it's often removed, this plant increases elevation. It, it, it has a, a woodier stem than the Spartina, and it doesn't decay as fast, and, it and a marsh can elevate better with uh, phragmites. So it may be that, you know, 100 years from now, the marshes with the Phragmites may still persist as, as marshes, while the marshes with the Spartina may have been drowned underwater. There's Phragmites, in case some of you don't know what it looks like. OK, so that's a look at some physical changes. Some chemical changes have to do with pollution. And there's many, many different kinds of pollution. I'm just going to touch on a very few. Uh, types of pollution. One is an uh, example of, of mercury, and mercury is uh, a type of chemical that undergoes a, an increase as it goes through the food chain. And this diagram is trying to show, in a not terribly effective way, but the size of the red dot is representing how much mercury concentration there is. So there's very little in the water, there's very little in the plants, a little bit more in the small fish, and more in the big fish, and more in the people or whoever is eating the big fish. So as you go up the food chain, the concentration of mercury gets higher. And this is a process called biomagnification. Bioaccumulation just means animals are taking up the chemical. But magnification means it's getting more and more as you go up the food chain. And here's another type of pollution, uh, garbage. Salt marshes have been used as garbage dumps in many parts of the world. Another really serious issue uh, in coastal marine areas, not just marshes, but the whole coastal and also freshwater is excessive nutrients. 
Now, we know nutrients are essential. You look at the label of your food and you look for what kind of nutrition you get. And plants need nutrients. The problem is when there's too much. And you have fertilizers here in agriculture or in your lawn or wherever. And you have farms and animals with wastes that also are putting in nutrients. So you get excess nutrients going into water bodies from fertilizer running off, from sewage, from urban inputs and so forth. There's a bunch of different sources bringing in excessive nitrogen, the, the nutrient mainly involved in coastal areas causing problems is nitrogen. And, and the problem it causes is shown in this diagram. What you've got here is wastewater coming in, either runoff or from sewage treatment plant. You get the nutrients. What's the nutrients do in the water? It stimulates a bloom of single-celled algae in the water. So this growth, it may discolor the water, it may not, but you have huge numbers of the single-celled algae. And after the bloom has sort of lived its, its life, it, plants will die and sink down to the bottom. And they sink down to the bottom and they're going to be decayed. When they, things die, bacteria work on them and decay them. The process of decay uses up oxygen down here. So you end up, as a result of the excess nutrients, you end up with low oxygen in the, down near the bottom. And of course, the fish that can swim away will get away if there's somewhere to go to that doesn't have the same problem. And then your other critters that can't swim away very fast will just be very stressed and possibly die depending on how low the oxygen goes. This low oxygen is called hypoxia. Hypo meaning low. Uh, there's also a term anoxia meaning it's down to zero and there's no oxygen. And there have been found places where it's gone actually down that far. Okay, so that's a sort of a really quick look at pollution, chemical changes that people have made. And then the third type of change is biological alterations, which is what we call invasive species. That is, species that have, are not native that cause problems in their new environment. There are a lot of species that are non-native that may come in and fit in just fine in a new place and not cause problems. The word invasive is referring to those that are causing some kind of problem. And here's our friend Phragmites, the common reed again, one of the invasives around here that people are hating. Um, the species has been here in the U.S. for over a thousand years, but what's, and, and minding its own business in the high marsh and doing nothing. But somewhere maybe 60 years ago or so, a new variety, so it's the same species but a different genetic type arrived, and it's this new type that has been then moving down the marsh, taking over the zones of all the other, I showed you, diverse kinds of plants that live on salt marsh. Phragmites comes in and takes over the whole marsh. So you end up, instead of maybe a dozen different species of plants on the marsh, you end up with Phragmites alone. Uh, so I just said this, okay. So it's reducing the diversity of plants on the marsh surface. Uh, a recent study that just saw last week analyzed data from all over. There have been lots of money spent in the U.S. to try to get rid of the Phragmites. And they've spent, and, and you know, this study looked at what, what had been done, mostly spraying herbicides on it, and, and found out that in most cases this isn't successful. So we have wasted a huge amount of money spraying pesticides on the Phragmites. Um, that was kind of interesting. 
not cheerful, but interesting. Um, now, cord grass. This is the one we love, right? Our Spartina in the low marsh, the plant that's native here, and we know it and we love it. But when this plant ends up on the west coast, they hate it. So it's interesting, isn't it? You know, the one we love, they hate in, in the west coast. In California, they really value mud flats. It, a lot of important things live in mud flats. When Spartina arrives, it not only gets there and turns mud flats into marshes, it hybridizes with the native marsh grasses that are there and becomes and, and really takes over. So it turns open mud flats, which they love, because a lot of things, important things that live in those mud flats. And so they are considered a threat to the invertebrates and water birds that depend on these mud flats. Uh, and the hybrid plant just grows and, and grows into the ditches and the small creeks that the endangered clapper rail likes to live in. Spartina has also arrived in China where the native plant on their marshes that they love is Phragmites. So here you have the total reverse of the situation. Here the Spartina is invading and taking over from Phragmites and they're worried what to do and they're going to be, you know, spraying pest the herbicides on the, you know, it's just like the flip side and, and um, you wonder sometimes, you know, is there some degree of, of uh, you know, xenophobia here in the way we deal with uh, invasive plants. But here, you know, here's one of these mud flats, and here the Spartina arrived, and they're beginning to turn this into a marsh, and everybody in California and Oregon hates it. Okay, not only plants are invasive species. Green crabs, which we have here, are not native here. They're native to Europe. They arrived here over 100 years ago, um, and they have recently spread further north, and they've recently come to California. One thing about green crabs, they are very effective at eating clams and, and oysters, small, and bivalve mollusks. They are very, very good at doing that. And uh, when uh, they arrived in Maine, there was a loss of some of the clam fishery, and, and it's li very likely that's the green crab eating up the juvenile clams, uh, the soft clams. Uh, and they're also seeming to have negative effects on the West Coast, where they arrived only maybe less than 20 years ago. Uh, on, on native crabs. They'd be out competing the native crabs for food. Uh, then here's another one. It's the Chinese mitten crab, a newer one. Um, interesting, this is a very valuable in China. It is cultured in, in far, you know, fish farming type thing. They culture it because they eat it and it's apparently you know, fine to eat. Um, it arrived in Europe in the 20s, the Pacific Coast in the 90s. It makes, it forms very large colonies. It digs a whole lot of holes in the, in the marsh. Uh, people, um, you know, it, it has caused a lot of ecological change in the Pacific and they uh, damage, you know, damage to it. It can walk over land to get from one body of water to another. They eat all kinds of stuff. Uh, maybe they were released deliberately. They were found in Chesapeake and in the New York area, 2007 to 2009, and maybe 2010. They haven't seen them the past couple of years. Does that mean they're not here anymore? No, but they just haven't found them and they may not be establishing and becoming very successful. But we can't really say that until, uh, you know, we have to wait a few more years to know. Uh, maybe they're just sort of hanging out at low numbers and may increase later. We don't know. We're sort of waiting. Now, marsh restoration is a very hot topic, has been for about 20 years. 
um, it's something that is being done to try to repair damaged marshes. It is what I would call an art that is on its way to becoming a science. Uh, it's a lot of trial and error and a lot of learning from the mistakes you make. Um, one of the reasons that it has become such a, a big deal in the past 20 years was a policy that the first President Bush set, which was there should be no net loss, in quotes, of wetlands. That means if you're going to fill in a marsh here for whatever reason, you have to make a new one somewhere to make up for it. And you need to put in more acres than you destroyed. So that's really what stimulated the whole development of marsh restoration projects. In some cases, restoration is not really the right word, because restoration means you're going to put it back to what it used to be. And in some cases, you're making things that never were there before at all. So it's sort of marsh creation rather than restoration in some cases. But some of the things that people need to be thinking about as they are developing or restoring or whatever you want to call it, uh, these marshes, is what are you doing this for and what will you want to see before you say your project is a success? So what species, is that what you're looking for? What vegetation, how tall should they be? Are you looking for fish to be using it? How productive should it be? And so forth. So people need to think through what their goals are and not just say we're going to plant some spartina grass here and, and we've restored a marsh. Because sometimes you can plant some spartina there and it might look the same, but if you go in and take a more serious look and who is there and what are the functions, you can find that what might look like a nice spartina marsh is just some spartina plants growing there and you haven't got the rest of the community and you haven't got restored functioning. So those are the sorts of things that need to be thought about. Um, some of the ways that marsh restoration is done, sometimes marshes are choked when there's roads or railroads having come over them and it's reduced the tidal flow up a creek and so that past the creek, it's, it, it doesn't get enough water flow. Uh, and, and for example, this, this is an, a place where there was one 12-inch pipe under the road. And that wasn't enough water to come up to get enough tidal exchange. So what they did was they took away the 12-inch pipe and put in 24, 24-inch pipes. So you now have this, you have um, essentially eight times more water can get up there. And, and that, if you can get more water up in an area that hasn't had enough tidal flow, uh, the plants can come back themselves and, and the marsh will take care of it by itself. You know, you build it, you get the right water flow, you build it, they will come. And, and that works very well when this is the cause of the problem. Other cases, we have a very drastic thing. We have a Phragmites marsh that people want to turn into a Spartina marsh, and they will, you know, put herbicides out to kill the, the Phragmites. They put bulldozers out to lower the marsh surface, and then you get an army of people out there to plant the Spartina. Uh, this is very labor intensive, very expensive. And if you've left a little bit of the underground parts of the Phragmites there, you haven't gotten every last one out, the Phragmites is going to come back. And that's part of the reason that study I referred to before was finding, you know, we're spending all this money and we have very little to really show for it at the end. Uh, the last couple things I wanted to mention was. My second favorite marsh, my first favorite is Akabonic here in, in Springs in East Hampton. My second favorite is sort of the ugly, uh, the ugly marsh in New Jersey, uh, the Hackensack Meadowlands, right? That little pink dot in that part of New Jersey. 
This is an aerial view of the Hackensack River. This is a very urbanized area. This area was loaded with garbage dumps for most of the 20th century. The river had hardly anything living in it. It's got, had industry factories up and down for most of the 20th, the first half of the 20th century, dumping out, polluting with mercury, with PCBs, with dioxin, you name it, it's there in the river. So this was a real mess. And uh, so the garbage dumps, raw sewage, et cetera. It was the, but it's the largest open space in the metropolitan area. Uh, in the 1970s, we had the Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act said you've got to have sewage, you've got to treat the sewage, you've got to have sewage treatment plants. That started the improvement. You got more oxygen in the water because you had less sewage, raw sewage. You had treated sewage coming in instead of raw sewage. The fish started coming back. Fish maybe weren't the healthiest, but they were there. We also, around the same time, set up what was the Hackensack Meadowlands Development Commission. It was a state agency that was set to regulate and, and eventually close the garbage dumps. And this is an agency that had a kind of double purpose, which sometimes conflicts with each other. They were assigned development, and they were also assigned cons conservation. Uh, that's kind of schizophrenic to be able to be, re you know, you're supposed to be doing development, but you're also supposed to be doing conservation. So um, it was difficult to walk that thin line. In 2003, as a result of a change in the political atmosphere, they changed their name to the New Jersey Meadowlands Commission. They took the word development out of their name and out of what they were about. They are now a conservation agency. And uh, they're emphasizing conservation and improving the environment and protecting the environment instead of development. So this was something that, you know, those of us who worked there were very happy. There were big battles, obviously, before this all happened. And so we have now the Meadowlands, which used to be, you know, the pigsty of the world, is now, you know, it's not like out here. By a long shot, you look up and you see the Empire State Building. But if you look down, you see a lot of marsh. If you look in the water, you'll find a lot of fish. You've got egrets. You know, you've got a place that you can have people kayaking and enjoying nature. If, if, if anybody had said to me, you know, 40 years ago, that they would be running eco-tours in the Hackensack Meadowlands, <laughs> I would have just fallen off my chair laughing. Um, and, and they are doing that now. And, and this gives me great joy. And it gives me hope for the future for salt marshes. If the Hackensack Meadowlands can come back, at least partly, from all that abuse, there is still hope. And that's where I end the talk with hope. So thank you. And I'm happy to um, answer any questions. And after, you know, we can go out and I, if you take a look at the book. I have a couple other books. If, you, you know, if anybody's interested, that's great. Yes? In that earlier photograph of the salt candy and harvester? Yes. It was used for, for keeping animals on, you know, in barns and stuff. It was used for, um, I think it was packing material. It was used in a whole variety of different things. And I think, I don't think the animals ate it because it was probably too salty. But it was, somebody knows better than I? <laughs> Insulation. Okay, thank you. You, uh, you said something, I think, about coloration, like mining causing... The marsh color. rises. Why is that? Why is that? When the Phragmites doesn't decay as fast. So when it <coughs> dies, 
you've got these thicker stems that don't turn into detritus anywhere near as fast. And that will trap more sediment and just not decay so fast. So it will help build up the height of the marsh. I, I see on, on salt marsh, I mean, I have it up too, they're constantly breaking apart. You know, the edges of the falls. Falling up. in. You, yeah, falling. Yeah. That's natural or that's just? This, this can happen in Spartina marshes as well. I've seen that too. Um, and it happens worse in marshes that are more, um, have more eutrophication, excess nutrients, because at, in, in those marshes, the roots of the plants aren't growing as much as the leaves of the plant. So you get a plants that are more not stable, you know, you've got these sort of wimpy roots and a big thick plant and it's more likely to fall over and take a chunk of marsh with it. So, yeah. Yes, in the back. Speak up loud. The effects of mercury are many. The main worry about mercury is that it is highly toxic to the nervous system, especially developing nervous system. So an embryo or a, a very a juvenile, young animal or person are particularly affected by mercury, extremely sensitive. So we call it a neurotoxin because it particularly damages the nervous system. Don't eat tuna fish every day. <laughs> eat tuna fish now and then because tuna fish and swordfish are, we, we talked about mercury building up in the food chain. So a really big fish, like a tuna fish that's, on the, that's a predator high up on the food chain, that that's where you'll find highest amount of mercury. So my advice is for kids, or parents, don't eat too much tuna fish. I'm not saying never eat tuna fish, but don't make it a habit to eat it a whole lot. Because that's a major source for people, unless you live in an area where there's, you know, great mercury pollution problems, which is not an issue here. Yeah. I, I talk louder, please. The original, the originals are somewhere. I haven't seen them. I haven't looked everywhere, I must confess. But the people that have looked around New York, New Jersey, um, not out here, the New York, you know, inner, the Jamaica Bay, uh, you know, uh, inner Long Island and New Jersey, People who have looked have found only that newer invasive strain and not the original native. I'm sure they're still somewhere, but they're not around here. They might be out here if someone wants to, you know, do a, do a look, but they're, they're still somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. They are doing studies in the most mercury contaminated creek in the Meadowlands, a place called Berry's Creek in the Meadowlands, uh, which is one of the most mercury contaminated places in the whole world. And it's on the Superfund list. And 
they will eventually um, get to dig it all up and take it away under the Superfund. But they have not done so yet, even though it was shown in the middle 1970s, people saw that this place was, you know, at that time, at that time, the most mercury contaminated place anybody ever knew. Now it's only one of the more contaminated. They haven't done anything yet. They are studying. EPA process, it got into all kinds of litigation. Who's responsible? Who's going to pay for it for 40 years? And now they're doing what they call a remedial investigation. And I would say maybe in another 20 years, they'll uh, dig it out. I don't know. I, I hope I'll be around when they do so. Yes? My question is, I guess I'm thinking of the Hudson River and the PCBs yep, and the mercury. Right. Doesn't the sediment encapsulate this, uh, the PCBs and the mercury? And by digging them up, doesn't that cause a greater damage than... That has that is certainly an issue. Yes, newer sediments coming in will bury the, the more contaminated sediments over time. But why are we spending because, of dollars because when something like a big storm, and it doesn't have to be sandy level storm, a big storm will come and churn things up, you're going to expose the lower sediments that are still very contaminated. I'm not saying the new ones are totally clean. The newer ones are less contaminated than the lower ones. But storms will churn things up and expose it. So, you know, you'd have to have it you know, many, many feet down before you can be assured that uh, there won't be any more problems. So that, you know, that was, and, and, and they have changed the techniques of the dredging to get them out of there. They put, you know, solid curtains around the area so that whatever gets churned up in the process of dredging to get the, contam the highly contaminated sediments out of there is not going to be distributed all over the place. So they have carefully developed techniques to, you know, keep it within a restricted area when they're dredging. And the PCBs that are being cleaned up in the Hudson River, uh, it's been going on for, I think, two years already, and they still have more to do. Uh, I have heard very positive um, reports about that it's not spreading it and that it's doing good. So, yes? What do you think about the health of aquabonic I think aquabonic compared to the Hackensack? No. <laughs> no. Aquabonic is, is pretty good. And it's pretty good because there's a really dedicated, wonderful group of people that are looking at looking over Akabonic, the Akabonic Protection Committee. And I think, you know, I will give them a round of applause. I think they're terrific. And they are making sure that Akabonic is not going to go downhill. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the ocean, the ocean. Healthy plant. 
loud. Research on a marsh. Uh, so, I mean, and you hope that your answer will be helpful. Uh, for example, um, re some research has shown that Phragmites, the common reed that people hate, is much better at holding on to pollution, mercury, and other metals, while the Spartina picks it up and releases it back into the water. The, the Phragmites holds it down in the roots, which would be useful to know where people are going in a polluted area and deciding to do restoration and get rid of the Phragmites. Well, maybe you shouldn't do that here. Maybe in this mercury polluted area, you should let the Phragmites stay there. Don't take it away because it's doing a good thing in terms of the mercury. So you've got to know what you're wanting to do. But I mean, that research could be used if people wanted to sort of change their orientation from the attitude that we have to get rid of Phragmites wherever it is. I don't know if that's answering your question. I didn't get the whole question. So um, let's go to this one. Is eelgrass yeah. considered part of the salt marsh? Is what? Eelgrass is not part of the salt marsh. No, salt marshes are plants are the plants that are in the intertidal area. Eelgrass is growing full time underwater, so that's what's called submerged aquatic vegetation (SAV) for short. The marsh is intertidal, so it's partly in the air and partly in the water, depending on the tide. Eelgrass are fully submerged all the time. But they're very important also and really interesting. But they're not part of the salt marsh. Great. Uh, Dr. Weiss, I believe we'll be available outside for if you have any further questions. Right. Be happy to. to. Thank you. Thank you for coming. There are some more questions outside. We hope to see you in the news for our next seminar. How do I get this out of here? I don't want to just pull it. There's right, got to right. be some yeah, uh, some magic thing to do.